National Cooperative Development Act webinar. I am Sharice Razor, the Membership and Sponsorship Manager of NCBA and today's webinar moderator. We're pleased to offer this free webinar explaining what's on the bill, what impacts it would have, and how we can lobby to support its passage. You may send us a question at any time during today's webinar by typing them into the Q&A box in the control screen on your right. Your panelists will answer all questions at the end of today's webinar. Today's panelists, we have Lisa Solarski. Lisa is the Executive Director of Co-ops USA, the Cooperative Development Center at the National Cooperative Business Association. Prior to NCBA, Lisa worked for Keystone Development Center developing co-ops in Western Pennsylvania. She earned her master's degree in community economic development with a specialization in cooperative development from Southern New Hampshire University in 2010. We also have R.L. Condra. R.L. is the Director of Public Policy with the National Cooperative Business Association. He serves as the lead legislative representative for NCBA's public policy and develops and implements cooperative finance and tax council objectives. Prior to NCBA, RL oversaw rural development and broadband issues for the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. Prior to that, RL was the Director of Congressional Affairs for the Delta Regional Authority, a regional planning and economic development agency that serves 252 counties and parishes in the eight states. We also have Peter Frank. Peter is the Advocacy Coordinator for the Cooperation Work Urban Circle, working specifically to support passage of the National Cooperative Development Act. He lives in Philadelphia, where he is working to open a cooperatively owned grocery store called the Kensington Community Food Co-op. Peter? OK, so um, hi, everybody. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll just start then, Cherise. Yeah, Lisa, thank you. Sorry about that. That's OK. Um, so I was just going to give you guys a little bit of background um, about um, how the National Cooperative Development Act um, was started and what it actually means to the cooperative community, um, the cooperative development of people in, in specific, uh, specifically. Um, in 2010, in May, uh, Cooperation Works had a semi-annual meeting. And during our strategic planning session, we identified um, urban cooperative development as um, something that was a challenge for us because we weren't funded to do um, urban cooperative development uh, by the federal government as we are. Many of our cooperative development centers are funded um, to do rural cooperative development through the USDA. Um, and we've seen an increase in um, uh, requests to develop cooperatives in urban areas, and in particular, low to moderate income urban areas. Um, so uh, we actually um, uh, we, we formed the urban circle. What a circle is in cooperation works is essentially a, a committee. Um, and uh, we formed the urban circle. Um, to address this problem by creating a strategic plan and then setting up the implementation of that strategic plan um, in order to fund urban cooperative development. The very next day, Bob Noble and I were in Chaka Fatah's office. Um, and uh, Chaka Fatah's representative from, uh, represent, he's a congressional representative from Philadelphia. Um, and we were um, actually advocating for the Rural Cooperative Development Grant in his office. And Michelle Anderson Lee, who is his chief of staff, uh, asked us if there was a similar grant for urban cooperative development. Um, and we told her that literally the day before, we had just talked about you know, um, embarking upon that journey. And so um, uh, in October of that year, October of 2010, um, our newly formed uh, Urban Circle and Chaka Fatah got together in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, Chaka Fatah agreed to be the champion for a bill that is, has basically become uh, the, uh, the, 
the, the key to um, hopefully the success of the urban circle. Um, we made some legislative recommendations in December of 2010. Um, and in March of 2011, we did a congressional briefing on the benefits of cooperatives in general. Um, and then in, um, uh, in the spring, uh, we had a draft bill. And we had a legislative review committee go through um, that bill, literally every single word we reviewed, um, and, uh, and made our recommendations. And the bill that we have today is pretty close to exactly what we recommended. To, uh, uh, to Chaka Fatah's uh, staff in, in um, June of this year. Uh, so the Dear Colleague letter um, has just gone out. Um, uh, and, and the Dear Colleague letter is, is the, the letter that Chaka Fatah has written to um, his colleagues asking them to be original co-sponsors to the National Cooperative Development Act. And Peter, if you don't mind uh, uh, giving the slide. So, um, the significance of the National Cooperative Development Act is, is actually um, uh, pretty important to cooperative development. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the only federal funding for cooperative development in the United States um, comes through the USDA. Um, and it's earmarked for rural areas only. I mean, we get a lot of um, uh, requests to do cooperative development in urban areas. Um, the Small Business Administration also has technical assistance funding. Um, they, they have like 70 or so centers around the country. Um, but those centers don't offer cooperative development technical assistance. They're actually not funded to offer cooperative development technical assistance. And they also don't have the expertise in cooperative development. It's kind of a specialized field. Um, in 2009, 50% of all the technical assistance that was done by 16 cooperative development centers that were surveyed, 50% um, of it was, was done pro bono. Um, just to give you an idea of you know, um, how much need there is out there. Um, and um, cooperatives provide a participatory democratic option um, for economic development. And, uh, and that's pretty. Um, uh, it's a pretty important topic right now um, on the national level. So uh, for all these reasons, we're hoping that Congress will pass the National Cooperative Development Act. Um, and RL is going to talk a little bit now about uh, the actual bill and, um, and what's in it um, and, um, and what we should expect from it. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, this is RL Condra. I'm the Director of Public Policy here at NCBA. And I know a lot of you have been working on this and have been excited about this for a long time. And we're, we're very excited that, that the bill is here and we're ready to get moving on this. So uh, without further ado, what's in the bill? This is the National Cooperative Development Act of 2011. The legislation will create a new federal program for cooperatives in which both urban and rural cooperatives will be eligible for funding. The focus will be assisting cooperatives in underserved areas. And the program will be created through the Agency of Housing and Urban Development, which is known as HUD, but will be implemented and administered through the creation of a National Cooperative Development Center. The purpose of the is a 21-page bill, but overall the purpose of the bill is to create jobs and increase economic development in underserved communities by promoting cooperative business development. And some of the highlights here we have uh, here, here is uh, bullet points are loan funding and seed capital to groups forming co-ops, grants to centers to provide technical assistance to co-ops, funding for professional development training for technical, technical assistance providers, and the ability to, uh, in the legislation it has um, the, cooperative, the National Cooperative Development Center may uh, create up to three uh, cooperative development centers uh, per year that are not, are not present in, in existing areas. So that, that's a nice uh, compliment there. And, a 25, and if the bill is enacted, it will be authorized this program for $25 million uh, appropriation for the years of 2012 to 2016. So how does it work? The, after 
within one year of the enactment of the legislation, the Department of Housing and Urban Development will have a competitive process where they will select a National Cooperative Development Center. That center will implement and administer funding, uh, administer funding and implement the, uh, the program. The, and how, how do they do this? Well, the, the funding will go, will be eligible to local cooperative development centers, uh, centers that are organizations that are, have expertise in cooperative development. And they will receive technical assistance, uh, cooperative development funding, things of that nature, where they will, where they will use that funding to uh, trickle down to uh, helping to create local cooperatives and to develop uh, and have, have, these, have the cooperatives grow. A few slides here on the responsibilities of what HUD does, what the National Cooperative Development Center will do, and things of that nature. Uh, on this slide, HUD will select the National Center to administer the program, develop a strategic plan outlining the program guidelines, the budget, and work plan, and it will also be responsible for producing an annual progress report. The National Center, as I mentioned earlier, will be selected through a competitive process, uh, disperse funds to local development centers, but also through this legislation will have a create a revolving loan fund where 45% of the funding will be allocated to, to the revolving loan fund. As I mentioned earlier as well, incubate development of new local centers, provide training and support to professional cooperative development developers and monitor and evaluate recipients of funds. The local centers will be selected as well through a competitive process with a funding agreement up to three years, provide technical assistance to local cooperative businesses in underserved areas, provide training and instruction for the purpose of cooperative development, and will meet performance targets approved by the National Center. Uh, also through this program, there's the eligibility of multi-year grants uh, through this legislation as well. I wanted to point that out. As I mentioned with this legislation, although urban and rural cooperatives are eligible for this funding, the, the key piece of this is that these cooperatives need to be in, in an under, or service to underserved areas. And there are four definitions that this, this program will recognize uh, being underserved. Uh, number one is within a low to moderate income area is defined by the U.S. Census. Two, within a low income community is defined by the IRS. Uh, the, the third one would be an area adjacent to the, to the number one and number two of these definitions. And then the fourth would be an area given approval by the National Center itself and that will be a limited uh, uh, opportunities for, for that definition. Uh, so it's kind of a broad, broad picture and uh, something that I think a lot of our communities can work with. And now I'll turn it over to Peter. All right, thanks, Arnell. Um, so that's our that's the legislation uh, in a nutshell. Um, I, I really recommend that all of you actually read the bill um, and tend to appreciate a lot of the details in it. But essentially, what RL just went through is is what the National Cooperative Development Act did. So now that we have it, um, after uh, you know almost a full year of, of work um, put into it, we need to get to work to to help make it become law. Um, so on this slide, I've outlined the nine steps. There's probably some more, but this is sort of the basic uh, high school civics class version of how a bill becomes law. And we're right here at step number one, before the legislation is actually introduced. Um, we have this window of opportunity between when the Dear Colleague letter went out a week and a half ago um, and when the bill is actually officially introduced on the House floor. Um, that's where we are right now, and this is uh, the time where we are launching the really launching the campaign to uh, recruit co-sponsors. Um, and this is a good opportunity for us to really get a lot of good momentum early on. It's an important step. Um, when the bill is introduced on the House floor, we can demonstrate that it has a lot of support. 
Um, so that's why we're asking you folks in the campaign to, to get out and recruit co-sponsors ahead of its introduction. So that's what the original co-sponsorship is about. Um, and immediately after the introduction, um, we're going to continue working to recruit additional co-sponsors. Um, we just really want to continue to build support for it uh, to make sure that this gets passed. Um, and step three there is uh, really important. Um, after the bill is introduced, it'll be uh, assigned to a subcommittee. And we suspect that, well, we expect it to be assigned to the subcommittee on insurance, housing, and community opportunity because they have oversight of HUD uh, as well as other uh, eight government agencies and programs. Um, and we really want to focus on the subcommittee because that's where most legislation, um, you know, is decided. Whether live, most bills die in subcommittees, um, fortunately or, or, or unfortunately. Um, so we really need to target that subcommittee, um, talk to them, talk to the members that are on it. If your representative is on that subcommittee, um, it's really important that you pay them a visit and let them know how important this bill is because they're going to be the ones deciding early on um, whether this bill um, can, can move on. And if it does, then it's going to move on to step four um, where the full House Financial Services Committee will, will vote on it. Um, hopefully it, they'll take the recommendation of the subcommittee and then it can move on down the line and officially become law. Um, but those first three or four steps is what we're going to be focusing on right now um, with our early strategies. Um, so we decided as a, a committee work together on developing strategies to get this bill passed. Um, and we really wanted to focus on getting original co-sponsors. Um, that's what we're working on right now. Um, we also need to get support from the subcommittee members, as I mentioned. Um, so if you if your representative is is on the subcommittee, it's really important that you talk to them. Um, you know, and if they're not, it's still important to talk to them. We need support from from anyone, um, and bipartisan bipartisan support is also really important. Uh, given that in D.C. right now, the political reality is that you know, Democrats and Republicans have split control of Congress. Um, if, if this bill shows up with only Democratic support in the House of Representatives, it doesn't have much opportunity. So if you're represent in, a, in a district with a Republican as your representative, it's, it's really important to get them to, to support it as well. Um, so yeah, and we really do think that, that this bill will get bipartisan support. Uh, Co-ops have historically been supported by both Democrats and Republicans. And our cooperative businesses are doing a lot of great work, uh, whether it's in a, a red district or a blue district. Um, and because this is a, a fairly targeted advocacy campaign, we're really working to recruit effective co-op supporters. That's, that's you guys, um, the people that um, have found us because they care a lot about co-ops and, and heard about this bill and are excited by its opportunity. And, you know, we've gone out and done a lot of work to try to recruit some of you folks to, to be a part of this campaign. Um, and to help uh, work with you, we have a website uh, there, campaign.coop, and we have a, an, an email list that we're, we're using um, as well. So on the website, um, you can go and you can find out uh, news about what's going on, most up-to-date news. Um, through our blog feed there on the right. And um, you can also sign up and join our email list. There's the, the green green box right there. That's really important. If you're not on our email list, I really recommend that you join it today um, and encourage your fellow colleagues to join the email list. Um, that's where you're going to find out the most uh, up-to-date information and, and, and really help us, uh, help us out with, uh, with advocating for this bill. Um, you can also download the legislation. If you click on the, the legislation page, uh, you'll have uh, a link to the, a PDF of the bill, uh, a PDF of the Dear Colleague letter. Um, and it'll, we also have some talking points. Um, if you go to the Advocate page, uh, it really lays out specifics of how you can advocate for this bill. And we have talking points there um, as well. 
Um, so keep coming and returning to this website. It's being updated regularly. Um, and and if you're feeling generous, uh, we, we, we're looking for donations as well. We're, we're operating this campaign on a shoestring budget here. And, um, and, and any, any amount of donation would be gladly appreciated. Um, so that's our website. If you haven't been there, I encourage you to go. So, um, and also, I just want to remind you all that if you have any questions, go ahead and um, type it into the chat box. We're going to be uh, opening up to Q&A pretty soon. So go ahead and um, get your questions ready. Um, OK, so how are we going to advocate for this bill? Um, you know, there's a lot of people when you when you think about how to advocate for legislation or you know anything in terms of politics, you think of phone calls and emails and, and letter writing, and those are those are important um, in in certain situations. But we feel that since this is a new piece of legislation and that we're recruiting co-sponsorship early on, that it's most important and effective to have in-person meetings. Um, there is definitely the most effective way to, to get your representative's office to listen to you and your concerns and to get them to, to act on your behalf. Um, so that's what we're recommending, actually getting out and, and having a face-to-face -face meeting with them. Um, and how you do that, it's pretty simple. You just you call the local office um, and request a meeting. Uh, when you call up their office, ask to speak to their small business person or, or their economic development person. This, this staff member um, focuses their, a lot of their energy on, on these issues. Um, and they're the ones that are going to know most about how to help support this bill and, and have the most interest in it. So, so set up a meeting with them um, and, and coordinate with us. Let us know how, how you have set up a meeting, what, what, what date it is. Um, we're here to help you if you haven't met with the, you know, the representative's office before. Um, we'll, we'll walk you through it. Um, and we just really need to track the work that's being done by, by our, uh, our advocates out there. Um, and, and in the meeting, um, you know, we want you to make it personal. Definitely uh, talk to them about your co-op. Tell your story. Tell them about how great of a co-op you have and all the great work you've done for their um, their constituents and in their district. Uh, let them know about the number of members you have, uh, you know, sales, uh, other work done for charitable activities, uh, you know, number of jobs created, and all that stuff is, is really, really can help them understand what co-ops actually are and, and put a personal spin on it. Um, and then, of course, you want to explain to them what's in the legislation, what it could do for the district, um, and specifically, uh, yeah, look at the talking points. Um, we've picked out a few messages that we think are, are particularly relevant uh, right now to some folks. And we really need you to specifically ask them to be a co-sponsor, uh, literally in those words, like, will you or will your boss be a co-sponsor for this legislation? Because um, that's really going to indicate the amount of uh, support they have what their level of support for it, whether it's a maybe, a definitely yes, or a, a no way. We still want to know, um, and then report back to us. Let us know what they said to that question, um, and and what their concerns are. We need to know that, and so we can follow up. Um, and you need to follow up with them. It's this is about uh, forming a relationship with that person you meet with, and um, if they have any questions that you weren't able to answer in the meeting. Um, follow up with them and find out how to answer that question or get them, you know, at least say thank you for meeting with me and uh, if you need to follow up later on. Um, you know, a good opportunity actually is uh, during uh, during recesses when the, the representative is in back home in the district. Uh, you might actually get a chance to meet with them. So, so that's something to consider as well. So, so yeah, we could um, ourselves, we could spend all day long uh, calling every single member of Congress, you know, letting them know how great the National Cooperative Development Act is. But uh, but we really need you guys to, to do it for us because it's definitely more effective that way. So that's uh, here's our contact info if you want to get a hold of us and with any specific questions. But I think we're going to open it up 
to, to you guys to ask some questions now. We have some time left over. Hey, hey Peter, this is Ariel. Can I ask sure. you things real quick? Sure. The, uh, Brendan Cheney, Congressman Fatal's general counsel, who helped, uh, who did help to draft this legislation uh, and work with the Urban Circle hand-in-hand -hand on this legislation, is on the call. Uh, fortunately, he's traveling and can, and can only hear. He cannot uh, participate, but I want everyone to know that he's, he's, uh, this is very important to him and his boss, and he's here listening. And uh, maybe we can get him to participate uh, next week or on our next call we may have. But we just want to recognize that he's that he's uh, listening in right now. And and then the other thing I, was, I want to piggyback off of what Peter said. I've been doing congressional affairs. I was a former staff person and uh, do, scheduling congressional meetings and things of that nature for a long time. So if any of you have questions or need talking points or need help scheduling a meeting or who to talk to and how to do it, please use me as a resource. My email is on here, R.L. Condra, and uh, I'll be glad to give you a call and, and talk you through it. So uh, please use me as a resource through, through this process. Thank you, Peter, Lisa, and R.L. We're now ready for the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have not done so already, please click on the Q&A tab on the right of your screen to type in your question. So we have a few already. Um, the first is uh, someone would like to know, what is the time frame for the first step? Well, we, uh, we, the first step meeting, the, uh, when the I presume when the introduction of the bill will officially happen. And that's a good question. Um, we suspect that we expect it to be introduced uh, before the end of the year, so sometime in December. Um, so we do have a, you know, a couple week window of opportunity before it's introduced. So that's that's what we expect to, to have it introduced. Okay. And then the first step of your meetings, we need to get this going ASAP. Time, you know, it's during the holidays, and 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 the time frame is short. So. All right. Um, are there any talking points that's geared to Republicans? Specifically for Republicans, no. But um, I've created two versions of the talking points, one for urban districts and one for rural districts. I, I feel like the messages um, of job creation and economic development cross both, uh, both party lines. Um, but there's certain, you know, specific things for urban versus rural, um, and um, I think one of the, you know, a lot of Republicans right now seem to be really concerned with uh, with the budget as well as Democrats too, of course, um, and that's one of the things, key things for this legislation is that it's, um, you know, it's 25 million dollars. It's a lot of money, but it's uh, compared to a lot of other things in D.C. This is a pretty low cost, high impact bill. Um, so that's, uh, I think that's an important point. Okay. Uh, someone would like to know, should they focus on co-op stories about insurance or, or housing? Or the nationwide involvement in the campaign? Um, uh, sorry, um, this is Lisa. I think you should focus on the co-ops in your district. Um, whatever kind of co-ops you have in that representative's district um, uh, would be the ones that would be most interesting to your representative. Okay. R.L.? I, I agree. Uh, Brendan, uh, we're able to email one another right now uh, with, with the congressman's office. He said they're planning to, to introduce the bill, drop the bill, the first week of December. So that's going to be... Uh, a week and a half, uh, but even after he does, even if the congressman does introduce the bill, there'll still be time to add on co-sponsors. But that kind of gives you the time, for, the short time frame that we're, that we're on at this point. Uh, he does mention that uh, with the Financial Services Committee, there are 20 members on the full committee that have done work with co-ops generally, and five members on the subcommittee that he knows of that have, that are, are have interest in co-ops. Is there a list of representatives currently sponsoring the act?
Peter, you want to talk about that and how, you, how you'll do that on the website? Yeah, um, we, there currently is, is not a list of co-sponsors because it's a little, little early for that. Um, but we are on the website. It's not hasn't been developed quite yet, uh, but we will be uh, updating. We'll have a page where we're going to be able to update the progress and who's co-sponsoring it. Um, and if you join the email list, um, we're going to be tracking whether your representative is a co-sponsor or considering being a co-sponsor. Um, and you'll be finding out a little bit more about how to how to update our, our database and all that stuff um, in, in the next week or so. Um, but definitely need you get get you to join the email list so we can uh, help track some of that stuff. Okay. They are talking to the congressperson or staff. How much time do they expect the meeting to last? Also, should they bring handouts or do they have a problem? Presentation. Yeah. Sharice, you were you were breaking up on your question, but I, I think they uh, should I think they bring I, any handouts or and how long should they expect the meeting to last? It it just depends on the congressman or the staffer's schedule. Sometimes you have fifteen to thirty minutes. Uh, sometimes it's shorter. Sometimes it's longer. I, I would think that a meeting would take thirty minutes. Uh, I would recommend bringing handouts, some of the talking points that Peter's provided on the website. I would I would not do a PowerPoint uh, at all. I, I, uh, these folks are pretty busy, and uh, you'll lose them immediately with the PowerPoint. I, I would do handouts and, and talking points. Okay. And definitely, if you have handouts about your co-op, um, that uh, that 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 brings makes personal. It's great. Okay. Um, how many? Someone asked how many of them should meet with their congressperson at a time? And how big a delegation is too big? Well, I have been in meetings where there's one person. I've been in meetings where there's there's 20. Um, I would feel free to bring, as long as you, in my opinion, if you keep it less than less than 10, that would, that would be, uh, that would be great. Uh, one to two people is fine. Uh, I'd hesitate if you brought in more than than five people. Everyone wants to talk, and after everyone talks, it kind of gets to a long meeting. But uh, so that that's that's those are my thoughts. Okay. And someone would like to know if you can speak a little about the revolving loan fund. How will this fund uh, be used, and will it replicate funds like NCDF and CFNE um, loans to the co-ops for real estate, working capital, equipment, etc.? Or will the meeting, um, or will it meet other needs, such as financing, hiring, consulting to provide a TA for instances? Lisa you, were, Lisa, you were talking about the Revolving Loan Fund this uh, afternoon. Yeah, um, the Revolving Loan Fund would be, um, I, I mean, we, I don't think it says anywhere specifically in the bill exactly how that's going to work, but it would be my guess that the National Center would, um, after um, these cooperatives have, you know, um, been developed to a certain point, um, it, it would be my guess that the National Center would then be the organization that the cooperatives would apply to um, in order to uh, receive the loan money. But I, I would also imagine there would be some criteria, um, uh, like for instance, that they have raised a certain percentage of the funding that they need as equity um, and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, But that's really um, all up to the National Center at this point. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Okay, and another question is, does this act support any organizations that use a cooperative model of operation or just food stories? Or just food stores, I'm sorry. It's all co-ops, uh, any sector, any type. Um, definitely not just food co-ops, um, but food co-ops are included. Worker co-ops, producer co-ops, farmer co-ops, uh, housing co-ops. Yeah, so it, it crosses crosses all barriers of co-op sectors. 
Okay. And I believe that's it for my question. I have a few. Uh, Brendan and I are trading emails back and forth here, and he's brought he's brought quite a bit of clarification on some of the questions. Uh, on on what I was talking about on the underserved definition, he says that that the, that the, the legislation references the IRS code, which is actually the definition of a new market tax credit, and under this definition, uh, the criteria will. There's this definition the act will reach nearly 39% of the nation's census tracts, and it was specifically designed to reach areas in both rural and urban areas that are lacking in economic development. Uh, and regarding talking points, he said he'll be sending out a section-by-section -section description of the bill along with uh, talking points, or so we'll have additional talking points that we do have, and uh, we'll, we'll include those on the website as soon as we get those from him as well. And he, he also stresses this to talk about co your cooperatives in the in the congressman's district that you're you're meeting with. Okay. I have a few more questions that came through. Um, someone else would like to know is there a definition of co op used or reference to it in the legislation? It does. The definition for cooperative organization is, I'll just read it from the legislation itself. The term cooperative organization means an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned, democratically controlled enterprise. Right. Okay. Uh, is there a media campaign planned or are you waiting on media campaigns until co-sponsors are on board and the bill is in subcommittee? Um, yeah, essentially that's, that's right on. Um, this is a more a smaller, smaller scale, more targeted campaign. Um, you know, we don't have a Facebook page. We do have a website, which is great. Um, I think w when we see where this bill goes in the subcommittee, um, we'll begin ramping up more support for it and, and getting into more more avenues of media. Um, we'll be putting out some press releases and, and various things like that, um, but mostly counting on, on you all to, to put it out in your media sources. To use your Facebook pages, your email lists, um, you know, your newsletters, if you have a newspaper for your co-op. Um, so yeah, we're counting on, on you guys to help spread the word for now. Okay. And that's it for the questions that I have um, that was received. Is there anything else that um, the panelists would like to say before we close out the um, webinar? The, I'd like to, to touch base on the revolving loan question again uh, from Brendan. The revolving loan fund is being kept open. They want to focus on loans and loan guarantees, and the grants are for technical assistance and the National Center will drive how the fund is set up. And uh, he want to reiterate that all co-ops are eligible and in, uh, are included in this bill. And, uh, and they're focused on a media campaign as well. Okay. I guess my, my last words would be just to, to reach out to, to me and, you know, give me a call, email me, let, let me know who, who you might be meeting with and talking to. Um, I'm more than I've been talking to a, a good handful of folks already, but I'm, I, my job is here to, to help you guys uh, help us get this passed. So um, and we'll be doing some more of these conference calls or webinars, I think, down the road. Um, this was I appreciate those of you for coming out. You know, this is a tough week of Thanksgiving. Uh, we're all busy and traveling, so we'll uh, we'll be meeting again and have more opportunities to talk about it. Okay. Once again, I would like to thank the panelists, R.L. Condra, Lisa Solarski, and Peter Frank. Before we close, here are just a few announcements to our listeners. NCBA will post the slides from today's event at its website, www.ncba.coop, as well as www.campaign.coop. We plan to post them no later than Tuesday of the following week. We will also attempt to answer any additional questions that may be received 
that we were unable to address during the web conference and post the answers to the campaign and campaign's website as well as NCBA's website. Again, on behalf of our speakers and myself, thank you for attending and be sure to join us next time. Please visit us at www.ncba.coop for more information. This will conclude our broadcast. Thank you, Cherie. Thank you. <laughs>